Hi again, fellow boat builders. You know, over the years, I have referenced many good books on boat building. However, none of them explained in detail how to join plywood and boards together at their ends to make the longer pieces necessary for even the smallest of craft. This set of videos will cover my favorite method, the feathered scarf. With the development of good epoxy glues, it is both adequately strong and sufficiently versatile for many boat building applications. The scope of these videos will also be limited to those applications where the attached boards remain in the same plane. Even so, that leaves a lot of variation to cover, which in these videos will be covered in the order of increasing complexity. A feathered scarf is essentially matching planar surfaces cut at the ends of the parts to be joined. Of course, the devil is in the details. To see what I mean, Imagine a very large sheet of plywood that we cut in half by setting the saw blade at a shallow angle. We have created a feathered scarf joint. Then we temporarily tack the joint back in place. We can now proceed to cut a board out of the plywood. We could cut the board at any angle relative to the scarf and would end up in each of these cases with a different looking scarf joint. Let's place our pattern in this position as an example. Here is our board cut out of the plywood and we can now separate it at the original scarf. Let's take time to describe this surface. Note first that the scarf surface is planar and we will see later that making the scarf surface flat is a primary concern. The scarf face has four sides. Two sides are formed by the intersection of the sides of the board and the scarf face. We'll call these edges scarf edges. A third edge is formed where the scarf face intersects the bottom of the board, forming a feathered edge. So we'll call this edge the feather. The fourth edge is formed where the scarf face intersects the top of the board. We'll call this edge the strike, a geologic term I borrowed for our purposes. We'll need to define two additional lines in order to lay out our scarf joint. On the scarf face, construct a line perpendicular to the strike. This line we'll call the slope of the scarf face. On the board's face, construct a line perpendicular to a board edge. We will refer to this line as the edge perpendicular. The strike angle is the angle between the strike and the edge perpendicular measured on the board face. The dip angle is a bit more difficult to visualize. Construct a plane perpendicular to the scarf face containing the dip line. Since this line is perpendicular to the strike, this plane will also be perpendicular to the board face. Now extend the plane of the board face over the scarf face. Think of it as the board surface before we cut the scarf. The angle between this plane and the scarf face measured on the perpendicular plane is the dip angle. Note this angle is not the same as the angle formed between the scarf face and the bottom of the board as measured on the board's edge. The two are the same only when the strike angle is zero. In all other cases, it is larger. This angle is usually measured as a slope ratio rather than in degrees. For example, eight to one, meaning the scarf length measured on the original board face would be eight inches for a board thickness of one inch. More on this later. For the sake of simplicity, and because it is the most common method to make a scarf, let's analyze a scarf joint with a strike angle of zero. In this case, the strike is perpendicular to the board edges, and the scarf face is rectangular in shape. We'll investigate what the properties of the joint are as we vary the slope angle. General practice sets the slope at from 4 to 1 to 12 to 1. What are the trade-offs as we increase or decrease this angle? To get a better feel, let's look at the extremes. Here we have a scarf with a slope of 0 to 1 or 90 degrees, essentially a butt joint. Epoxy and other glues are strongest when exposed to compression and shear forces and weakest when exposed to tensional forces. When a butt joint is bent, extreme tensional forces are generated on the outside of the bend. To its credit, since there is no overlap, little or no wood is wasted. 
Wood is not uniform in its internal physical characteristics, such as elasticity, shrinkage, hardness, etc. Because of this, we want to join boards that have similar properties. More on this later. But for now, it should be noted that any differences are best accommodated when the change is distributed over a distance rather than at a single location. Since a butt joint occurs at a single location along the board's length, there will be the quickest transition from one board's properties to the other board's properties, leading to concentrations in stress and quick changes in flexibility, i.e. hard spots. This is generally considered bad. The other extreme is a slope at or near zero, say 1000 to 1. In this case, the scar face is parallel to the board face and is essentially a lamination joint. The forces imposed on the joint are mostly shearing, meaning the joint is very strong. That's good or at a cost of wood. The joint is nearly as long as the finished board, meaning a huge waste of wood with little gain in length. That's definitely not good. Finally, the transition from one board's physical properties to the other boards is extremely gradual, meaning there is no hard spots. To summarize, as the scarf slope increases, the strength decreases, and the hardness of the joint increases, both of which are undesirable but the wood that is wasted decreases, which is good. Furthermore, long scar faces are much more difficult to cut. Experience has shown that for most boat building applications, a slope from between 12 to 1 and 4 to 1 is a good compromise. I have found that 8 to 1 is a good overall slope when using epoxy glue. If you are concerned about avoiding hard spots, either decrease the slope, or better yet, plan ahead so that the joint is located at a place where minimal bending or twisting will occur. Next, let's lay out and simulate cutting a typical scarf joint, outlining the overall process, the details of which we will cover in later videos. In this example, we will scarf two boards of equal width and thickness. We want to join the two parts so that after gluing all the board surfaces continue across the joint in the same planes. In other words, the finished board is straight. First, make sure the ends to be scarfed are square. Then lay one board on top of the other so that they overlap, making sure that all edges are parallel. We will make a scarf with a 8 to 1 ratio. So adjust the overlap so that it is equal in length to 8 times the board thickness. As you will see later, this overlap need not be measured accurately. In fact, I always eyeball it. If you want to measure this overlap, do so, but now put your ruler away. We are done with it. With the boards clamped firmly in place, mark the mating board at the adjacent board's squared end with a pencil or scribe. Separate the boards and put a large X between the lines and the end of the board to avoid any confusion about where to remove wood. Put witness marks on the board's edges in case the face lines are accidentally removed. Our next step is to rough out the scarf surface with appropriate tools. More on this in later videos. Make sure that you do not cut the feather too thin at this stage. How close you rough out the scarf to its final surface will depend on your available tools and more importantly, experience. Usually, the closer you come, the faster the work goes because the amount to be sanded in the next step becomes smaller. Also, sanding costs more. Next, place one board on top of the other with both rough cut scarf surfaces facing up. Again, making sure that all edges are parallel. Slide the top board along the lower until the feather on the top board rests on the strike line of the bottom. When satisfied, clamp both boards firmly in place. Now using a belt sander, continue planing the surfaces. We are using a sander at this stage for two reasons. First, the pressure exerted on the boards is minimal, ensuring that the surfaces are not being distorted while being flattened. Second, we can easily sand both with the grain and across the grain. This allows us to make sure the surface is flat in every direction. The surface usually becomes perfectly flat before it is sanded to the point where these three things will happen. The feather on the lower board is paper thin. The feather on the upper board is paper thin. And third, the scarf surface has been sanded down to the strike line on the upper board. There is good technique to accomplish this, which we will cover in the next video. When finished, both feathers should be paper thin but still square, and the strike of the upper scarf should exactly match the strike line drawn earlier. 
If errors have occurred, it is not the end of the world, as we will see later. If all is well, then flip the top board over both lengthways and sideways, being careful not to damage the feather edge. We are ready for gluing. <laughs>